broadcast. I recognized it. Who is God? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. We'll get started. As I think you all know by now, I'm Clark Irvin, the director of the Homeland Security Program here at the Aspen Institute. I want to give a warm welcome to all of you who are with us here on our glorious Aspen Meadows campus. Uh, I made some very brief remarks last night. I'm going to expand on them. Last night's session was one that we jointly sponsored with the McCluskey series. Uh, today is the official opening of the Aspen Security Forum, and we're also joined by a listening and viewing audience on C-SPAN. So for uh, that purpose, I'd like to mention that this is the official start of the first annual Aspen Security Forum. It is an extraordinary gathering, a unique gathering, of policymakers, industry leaders, leading thinkers, top journalists, and concerned citizens. And we'll be discussing and debating over the next two days what I consider to be the most critical issue of our time the continued threat of terrorism and what we Americans can do to counter it. The forum could not be more timely, needless to say. When we began the planning for the forum more than a year ago, I think it's fair to say that the threat of terrorism was lurking in the shadows, and to some degree at least, the nation was going back to sleep. But the attempt this past fall to attack mass transit stations in New York, the attempt to blow up an airplane bound for Detroit on Christmas Day, and the attempt just last month to cause mayhem in Times Square all underscore the degree to which terrorists remain determined to strike the homeland again and how critical it is that we be equally determined to do everything in our power to stop them. These all too close calls raise the very questions that we will be grappling with over the course of these next two days. I want to thank our co-presenters, our media partners, the New York Times and GSN Government Security News, we look forward to continuing our partnership in years to come with both organizations, and in particular with the Times, we will be doing a Times Talk event with the New York Times at their headquarters in the fall on counterterrorism in October, and each of you will hear more about that in due course. I want to thank our sponsors, AGT International, Boeing, and IBM, and our supporting sponsors, the Ford Foundation, Northrop Grumman, and Stephen and Barbara Friedman, without whose collective financial support the forum would not have been possible. And there are a number of supporting organizations and individuals who are listed in the program who likewise, in, way, in one way or another, were instrumental in bringing us all together here in Aspen this week. And finally, a special warm welcome to what we have called Aspen Institute uh, Security Forum Scholars, which is a small group of special guests, most of whom are young up-and-coming uh, leaders to be in the field of homeland security and counterterrorism. Uh, first, a couple of very, very quick housekeeping items, and we'll turn it over to the, the main session. If you need anything, uh, Josh Diamondstein, Deb Cunningham, and Leah Dreyfus, uh, members of the Aspen Security Forum team, are here in the back, and they can answer any question that you might have. Second, uh, you should see on your uh, tables surveys. We are already underway uh, with the planning for next year's Security Forum, so we ask that you complete those survey forms at some point between now and whenever you leave. Third, a number of the presenters uh, over the course of these next two days will uh, have authored or have authored books relating to Homeland Security, and the local Aspen bookstore, Explore Booksellers, is located right outside a, a satellite office for the purposes of the forum, and books by presenters on Homeland Security and counterterrorism are available. And finally, there will be a number of schedule changes that we'll talk about in due course during the course of the forum. Now, I can think of no better way to start the Aspen Security Forum than to hear from the Department of Homeland Security, needless to say. And to introduce this morning's session with the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, my friend Jane Lute, whom I had the privilege of getting to know a number of years ago, I turn to David Abel, who is partner and vice president and the Homeland Security industry leader for one of our sponsors, IBM. David. Good morning, I'm Dave Abel, Vice President of Homeland Security at IBM. At IBM, we're pleased to be inaugural sponsor of what promises to be the leading Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Forum annually. As Clark mentioned in his brief comments last night, the real value of an event like this are, is in the discussions and the ideas those discussions create. At IBM, it's our passion to support and implement these ideas, as I know it is for many of you. The Aspen Security Forum aligns perfectly with our commitment to help secure our nation 
and provide thought leadership to help build a smarter planet. My IBM colleagues and I are participating in events throughout the course of the forum and appreciate this opportunity to be able to listen, to learn, and to engage with you in these important discussions. This morning, we kick off the event with a discussion with Jane Hall Lute, Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. She has more than 30 years of military and executive experience in the United States government, and prior to joining DHS, Lute served as the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, responsible for support to peacekeeping operations on the National Security Council staff under both President George H.W. Bush and President Bill Clinton, and Executive Vice President and COO of the United Nations Foundation and the Better World Fund. She also headed the Carnegie Commission on Preventing Deadly Conflict and was a senior public policy fellow at Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Secretary Lute is a thoughtful and engaging leader and we're fortunate to have her with us here this morning. Facilitating our discussion this morning is a familiar voice in Homeland Security, Jean Misserve. Jean came to Aspen last night from Toronto where she was covering the G20 summit and while we expect energetic debate through the day, I hope you'll help me keep my commitment to her that neither police nor riot gear will be required at any time during the event. <laughs> Jean is a correspondent for CNN covering Homeland Security for the network. She reports for CNN's Washington-based America's Bureau, a unit that combines the network's Homeland Security, Justice, and National Security beats to examine the state of security in the United States. Meserve was part of CNN's Peabody award-winning coverage of Hurricane Katrina, providing the first reports of devastating flooding in New Orleans, and also provided reports for two CNN Security Watch specials, Is America Prepared? Lessons of Hurricane Katrina, and Is America Prepared? The Next Disaster. Covering Homeland Security since 2001, Meserve has reported on security of the nation's ports, chemical plants, airports, and borders. Jean? Thank you so much. But who would have thought the lead story today would be about Russian spies? And not Al Qaeda, it smells like a bit of a time warp for us. Um, Deputy Secretary Lute, I know you've come here from the Gulf where you've been down dealing with matters relating to the oil spill. It's taken a lot of attention, it's taken some resources. How much has that distracted or degraded the department's counterterrorism efforts? Oh, I would say not at all. Um, the department very fundamentally believes that uh, fighting terrorism is job one. Uh, the Secretary Napolitano has said that, uh, the President has said that. Um, the challenge that we have in responding to the spill and overseeing the effort uh, to clean up the spill, to ensure that the well is capped, uh, and to uh, hold the responsible parties accountable is one that we take on as part of our responsibilities in Homeland Security. But as any of you know, and many of you do know uh, about the department, it has a wide wingspan of responsibilities. But a limited number of people. The secretary's been down there repeatedly. You've been down there. Hasn't it had some distracting impact at the very least? Distracting is really not the right word. Um, we are able to manage more than one thing at a time. Uh, we think every single day. I wake up every single day. The secretary wakes up every single day thinking about the main challenges that we face in Homeland Security. Um, we've just come through a year-long examination intensively of what it means to talk about Homeland Security. Now, one of the striking things about the department after its, its founding um, and the extraordinary work of the men and women uh, led by Secretary Ridge, Secretary Chertoff, others, some of you in this room, uh, is that this department is seven years old, eight years old now. It is not seven or eight years old. It's not one year old for the seventh time. It's not one year old for the eighth time. There's been an accumulation of knowledge, experience, and expertise consolidated and, and able now to clarify what it means uh, to speak about Homeland Security so we can do multiple things. Well, how do you know when the nation's secure? What's the test? What's the metric? Uh, it's a, not only is it a, it is a good question, it is a timely question. Um, because while the department has extraordinary brand name recognition, a lot of people still ask that question. What does it mean to, talk, to have a secure homeland? Um, and what we think it means, and, and we've looked at this really very hard, it, when you, to speak of homeland security is to speak of a safe, secure, resilient place where the American way of life can thrive. Um, that's the vision. Um, and as uh, someone once told me in my life, if you don't know where you're going, you're not going to get there. So when we talk about the vision for Homeland Security, it is a safe, secure, resilient place where the American way of life can thrive. The big threat to, of course, 
terrorism. We heard Admiral Mullen last night give his assessment of where he thought the greatest threat was. I'm sure you have your own matrix. Give us your take on it. So we think about that all the time in Homeland Security. In fact, you know, if, if counterterrorism is job one, very often uh, what you discover in public policy uh, in governance is that you are throwing remedies at a problem without any real theory of the problem. What are the greatest dangers that we face? Uh, certainly, it's Al-Qaeda and affiliated groups um, and, and their determination uh, to attack this country again, to attack our interests, to attack our friends and attack our allies. Um, and we are determined to be prepared and ready. So when we talk about having a vision for homeland security, a vision without a plan is, is at best a dream and at worst a nightmare. And so the question is, how do, what do you do about this vision? How do you achieve that? And we think building a safe and secure, resilient place where our way of life can thrive means we need to do five things. We need fundamentally to prevent another 9-11, prevent another terrorist attack here. We need fundamentally to secure our borders. Why? Uh, because there, it's, a, it's a threshold responsibility of sovereign nations to be able to control who goes in and, and who goes out and what comes in and what goes out. Um, but, but here you begin to see the dual nature of homeland security because on the one hand, while we want to keep out people, who, people and goods that might be dangerous, we also want to welcome legitimate trade and travel. It, we want to expedite legitimate trade and travel. The third thing we have to do is enforce our immigration laws. Again, because we want to welcome those who would enrich our culture and our economy, our society, but we want to keep out people who might be dangerous. And there, we have a fundamental right to know who lives and works within our borders. It's essential uh, to a stable economy to have a legal workforce. Um, and we believe that fundamentally. The fourth thing that we need to do is secure cyberspace. This is a new mission. Why? Because cyber capability lies at the heart of so much of American life. And then finally, we believe that we need to build a resilient country uh, to face all risks and hazards. You describe this threat as being external, something we have to keep out. Since the first of the year, 25 people who are either native-born Americans or naturalized American citizens have been charged with terrorism crimes. There's been a lot of talk within the department, I believe, about community outreach uh, and trying to address the problem in that way. Do you know if that works? What we do know, I, I spent a lot of my career uh, in national security, a lot of my career in international relations and foreign policy. I spent the last 15 years virtually on the outside of this country looking in um, and understanding the events and dynamics that give rise to violent conflict around the world. Um, and, and there are a lot of mythologies about violent conflict. There are a lot of mythologies about terrorism. But one thing we fundamentally know, Al-Qaeda is no mythology. Um, and its attraction and its ability to attract uh, followers and motivate people, um, not only to uh, discontent, but to violence, is real. And we know that there are people here who are attracted to that ideology and who are themselves uh, becoming motivated to violence. So what do you do about it? We do several things. Um, if you want to, our, our, our strategy uh, for countering terrorism really need, means we need to pull together the tools that we have at our disposal. If we're fighting terrorism abroad, um, we depend a lot on intelligence, certainly information. Our partners, we depend on those as well. Uh, we depend on the military um, fighting it's the wars that they're fighting. At home, those tools don't just simply, you can't just pick them up and put them here in the United States. What are the tools that we have? We have several tools as well. Um, we have our border tools, um, people, people and goods and things, uh, goods and things, people crossing our borders have to go through them, whether, whether actually or, or real. We have law enforcement, uh, not only federal law enforcement assets, but 800,000 state and local law enforcement personnel as well. Uh, we have intelligence and information, and we have the American public, an tr extraordinary, tremendous, resilient asset uh, in, the, in the combined effort that we all must undertake to keep ourselves secure. And what about the outreach to communities? What about that? The, the outreach to, to, to communities? For instance, to the Muslim community, to go out and try and build bridges. Um, does that work? Does it backfire? It, it, one of the extraordinary things about being an American is that you get to be many things. Uh, you're not forced into a miniature version of yourself where only one dimension of your identity, Muslim, uh, Jewish, Christian, defines you. 
Um, but you can multiply affiliate. We allow space for that socially and politically in this country. And while we do um, uh, reach out to Muslim communities, we do engage them. We do want to understand the challenges that they face and, and engage them uh, in the effort uh, to help protect our, ourselves. We do that with all communities as well. Um, we are actively seeking ways in which American society uh, can come together as we have so many times before in our, on our own mutual behalf. You mentioned law enforcement. In the Zazi case, there was a problem. Um, local law enforcement, New York Police Department was in the loop. Um, it was a participant in that investigation. And they went to somebody in the Muslim community, an imam, and spoke to him about the investigation. And he tipped off Zazi. And that resulted in a premature end to that investigation. Fortunately, it ended happily. But there was a misfire there. Local police and federal authorities were not working perfectly in tandem. One of the things that we really do believe in in Homeland Security is the power of community policing, where the police work within the community and together to understand from that level where local knowledge, local trust, local confidence gets built from the ground up. But more broadly, I think what you're speaking to is how do we understand this threat when it's beginning to materialize? And if someone is here in this country, the time that exists between when they might be moved to violent action and the time of actually taking that action might be relatively short compared to if they have to travel abroad. So we need to know more. Uh, we need to act wisely. We need to remember our norms and values that made this country great. And we need to craft strategies, again, working together uh, to keep ourselves secure. But at the moment, it's a huge problem for your department, isn't it? It's, it's, it, uh, is terrorism a problem for our department? Ter homegrown terrorism specifically. I mean, obviously terrorism is a problem, but the homegrown issue seems particularly difficult to get hold of because when you are, as you mentioned, dealing with an overseas threat, there are other tools that can be brought to bear. You don't have those here. And no, sometimes people can operate completely no. under the radar. I mean, that's exactly what I said. I mean, we don't, we don't just pick up and, and import the tools that are applied right. abroad here. We have the American public. We have state and local and federal law enforcement. We have the border tools. Um, and we have information sharing. We need to work on all of these in, in crafting strategies that allow us to know when disaffected people are going to move to, to the kinds of violence that we characterize as terrorists. And we absolutely we acknowledge this, uh, we accept it, and we're working intensively, not only across the federal government, but what in, in what we call in the Department of Homeland Security the Homeland Security Enterprise. Because Homeland Security is far more than just the department. It's individuals, it's families, it's communities, it's states, it's municipalities, and it is the federal, the entire federal family. Is it working the way it's supposed to in terms of information sharing? Um, but you have your fusion centers, you have your JTTFs, but is information flowing up and down the chain from local law enforcement to the federal government and back down again the way it should, I'm, the I'm, way it could? I'm, I'm smiling because of, of, the, of course not. <laughs> of course not. Where does it need to be improved? I mean, we have so and much information. We have so much information at times. I mean, we all feel like this in our everyday lives. We have so much information at times it feels like we have no information. I have all this information, but I don't have the information I need. And, and, and information is not enough. We do need to do better at sharing, and we do need to do it so in, in a way that protects our civil rights, our civil liberties, our sensibilities about privacy. But we also need to understand the action implications of what we know. And this is very fundamental, not only in our counterterrorism strategy for Homeland Security, but in building a resilient society able to face all risks and hazards. Do we have empowered individuals? What does that mean? It means individuals who know what to do, know what they're confronting, and know what to do when they confront it, when they, and, and can act on the information that they have in responsible ways. Capable communities who know their constituent members, know their strengths, know their weaknesses, um, and can bring and marshal resources to bear, not only for themselves, but with each other in a mutual aid kind of a way. And then we need a responsive federal system, one that understands its value proposition in this whole enterprise. How do we get there from here? It's, it's um, you know, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. It begins by understanding that this is, is an enterprise and it takes all of us. That everyone has a responsibility. In New York, if you see something, say something, um, is, the, is, the, is the motto that you see on every bus and taxi passing by. 
Um, it was a citizen who identified the Times Square bomber, um, who felt responsible and who went uh, to the police and authorities and identified these uh, that are individual. These are tight budgetary times. Local governments, state governments are having trouble balancing their budget. Local police departments are under duress. Do they have the resources they need to commit to this terrorism issue? Will they continue to have those resources, or are they going to decide, you know, something else is more important to me. I can't invest a couple of people at the Fusion Center, for instance. So one of the things that I've learned in Homeland Security, having spent my whole career in national security, is how different it is. National security is strategic, it's centralized, and it's top-driven. Homeland security is operational, it's decentralized, and it's driven from the grassroots. It's driven from the bottom. The communities and the states have a voice, um, rightly so. They will decide. It would be presumptuous of me to say whether or not they have the right resources that they need. But certainly what we know in the department is that we have to do everything we can to strengthen their resources. Um, through our grant programs, through the grant programs in the Department of Justice, through engaging, through the fusion centers, establishing capability, establishing standards, for example, in the area of resilience, so communities know what they need to do in order to be ready. Can you see the possibility of grant funding actually increasing in the coming years, oh, given the federal budgetary picture? I thought you were going to end that sentence of, can I see the possibilities? Of course I can. I Will it happen? I have a small child. <laughs> Um, in, in, in grant funding, of course, no, we're, we're in extraordinarily uh, uh, stringent uh, financial times. Everyone knows that. Uh, the department has benefited from uh, a, a very generous investment by Congress over the past several years. Um, but the fiscal constraints that are affecting everyone are affecting the department as well. And so this, we can act as though this is a surprise. Um, we all, and we all perhaps need to do business differently, um, but we still need to do business together. A lot of money has been spent on technology. Um, SBI Net, which was intended to guard the southern border, for instance, has not worked uh, as designed. Uh, puffer machines that were bought and deployed in the nation's airports didn't work well in the real world environment. Uh, there have been problems with devising uh, new nuclear detection equipment. What's the problem here? Why has so much money been spent on technology that hasn't worked as designed and planned? First of all, technology is only part of a system, part of a solution, part of a defense in depth, as we like to say, whether it's at the border or at the airport, uh, security in depth. Um, technology is a, is a very beguiling thing. Um, people are always in constant search for the silver bullet. Looking for silver bullets are like looking for dinosaurs in Manhattan. It's not there's no dinosaurs in Manhattan. There are no dinosaurs. And so we should, we should stop looking for the single point solution um, in any of these. The technology is improving our ability to detect. It's improving our ability to interdict and apprehend and prevent dangerous things from happening. But it, it doesn't exist alone. It exists within a system that we're trying to strengthen every day. Do you think the department is doing the right risk benefit analysis when it looks at technology, given some of the investments that have been made that haven't paid off? I, I think, uh, it, it, you know, in the public sector, uh, governments spend money in, in, or expend funds, I think, in, in three ways. You spend money. Governments spend a lot of it. Um, you invest some money. And you place bets, uh, I suppose, like we all do. Uh, will this work? Um, in many of the areas in Homeland Security, we're trying things that have never been tried before. And we're trying things on a scale that have never been tried before. And we're trying to address problems that are really problems of first impression, not only for us, but for all of us. How do we do this in a way? How do we ensure our security without sacrificing our liberties and our privacy? And so technology is a piece of that. Are we learning every day? We are. Um, are we getting some things right? We're getting a lot right. Um, and are there still challenges? Of course there are. Let's talk about those full body scanners, which are current, currently being deployed at the nation's airports. Would one of those scanners have caught Abdul Muttalib had he been put through one? It, it, you know, it, it, again, there are no silver bullets. Would it have detected? Would it have, would it have detected? Um, uh, the, the answer is possibly. Um, are we looking for absolutes? Then, then my answer will be disappointing to you. Um, but if we're looking again at a whole layered approach, uh, does it improve our ability to detect? They absolutely improve our ability to detect. Is it worth the amount of money we're spending for that degree of improved capability? 
It, it, th that marginal question is one that we're asking ourselves uh, every day. And, and the answer is always any option is a function of the alternatives available. Compared to what? We believe in this technology. We believe it enhances our detection capability and therefore enhances the security experience at the airport. But it's not the only link in the chain. Let's talk about some of the other links. Penetration testing in the past with bombs, bomb parts, um, through transportation security checkpoints um, has come up with some pretty appalling results in the past. What are the current tests showing you? I, I, I'm not going to go into any detail about our current technical capabilities. Are you seeing and what improvement? Uh, we see improvement all the time. Significant? Uh, significant improvement it is yeah, I, I would say that the answer is yes. I say the challenges evolve. The technology has to evolve. Our strategies have to evolve. Our systems have to evolve. And they will. Another one of the layers, air marshals. Do you have enough of them? Should they be on every flight? And, uh, the, fe the feeling is, is that we could use more air marshals. Uh, we do a risk base because you'll never have enough for every single flight, uh, every single day. Um, and so uh, combining a, a risk-based approach and the right number uh, of personnel, uh, we think they're an important asset as well. What kind of increase would you like to see? Uh, again, uh, you know, we are, uh, this as a single element of an entire process is weighed against the other elements of that process as well. So rather than simply pop off with you know, a 20% increase or a 10% increase, what we want to see is a system that the traveling public can have confidence in gives them a safe air travel experience. You know, one of the things we learned about, about the, the Abdul Muttalib on 1225, we, actually we learned a number of things from that experience. Uh, we learned, frankly, that if you can access the aviation, the global aviation system from one, any part, you potentially have access to the entire system. This is an individual that bought his ticket in one place, boarded a plane in another, transited a third location, headed for a fourth, and you could put any city on the map for those four locations. And so what we have to do, and, and what the secretary asked me to do in the immediate wake uh, uh, of that, uh, was to travel around to the aviation partners around the world. We went to 12 countries in 12 days on six continents. Um, and we talked to folks about what are the elements that we need to put together to, uh, to be able to ensure the traveling public that they're safe. Um, we, you know, if Al-Qaeda is putting, and, and, and its affiliates are putting their best minds to this problem, we certainly need to do the same, and we are. And what we learned were several things. Uh, number one, we, 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 we confirmed, I should say, uh, that we need to do better at information sharing. Um, the, the, it's one internationally thing, or domestic? That, internationally in this particular case. Uh, it's one thing to be dealing with individuals that you have identified as a, as a known or suspected terrorist. It's another thing to deal with the relatively unknown. Um, this individual was not totally unknown, as we all know, uh, but relatively unknown. Um, as the president said, we didn't connect the dots. We must do better at information sharing. Um, and that requires partnerships and a commitment to standards of information that we can gather on, tra on, on uh, travel uh, so we can expedite legitimate travel. The second thing relates to technology um, and the systems that are in place in, in airports. Uh, do we have the right kinds of technology deployed? Are people using it? In our case, particularly for the last points of departure to the United States, are we satisfied that the systems that are in place in these locations meet the standards that we think have to be met? And third, what we know is the strongest members of the system have to help the weaker members of the system to raise the level. So looking at the international situation, I know you've signed some agreements, but but is the world as a whole yet anywhere close to where they need to be in terms of tightening up the aviation oh, we security? Think that we think this has been a major agenda uh, of the secretary over the past six months. And how much progress have you made? We've made enormous progress. Uh, she's been to every region around the world that's had secured agreements and commitments of countries going in to a major gathering in September uh, to address this question and raise and what the standards. Are the, what are the specifics in those agreements? Can you tell us? Uh, just exactly? on the issues that I spoke about. Um, higher standards for information gathering and sharing. Better uses of technology um, mm -hmm. and the exchange of standards and, and, and technological information 
uh, and practice. Because again, it's not just any single discrete piece of equipment, but it's rather the whole system that we have in place uh, in an airport that makes for a secure system or not. And a mutual commitment uh, to raise uh, those weaker parts of the system to acceptable standards. We've mentioned Abdul Muttalib a couple of times. One additional question about that specific case. A similar bomb had been used against a Saudi official. A U.S. official, John Brennan, had gone over and gotten a briefing about that particular type of bomb. But it doesn't appear that that information was disseminated to, for instance, the TSA. So there was any adjustment in screening. Am I correct? And why didn't it work better? Uh, what, what I will tell you is that TSA, every single day, uh, a, a, TSA has a robust playbook of measures that it uses. Um, and it dynamically employs those measures so that we don't give uh, a potential adversary the benefit of predictability. And, and uh, in partnership with many countries around the world, uh, is constantly updating our knowledge base on what kinds of threats exist, what kinds of explosive, what kinds of technology, what kinds of strategies or procedures terrorists may attempt in order to stay a step ahead. But was TSA getting the intelligence it needed about this kind of bomb? The, the kind of material um, is, is but concealing not, a, it in not, this a, way. not a particularly exotic. No, uh, but concealing it in the underwear was something that had only been seen in this one Saudi instance before. Uh, again, without going into some of the specifics of, of the, the case uh, that you're talking about and the information that we had, we knew about this kind of material and the potential threat that it poses. Uh, and we are constantly working to ensure that we prevent that kind of danger from happening. Another part of TSA's mission, of course, is, is to protect mass transit. Something like one third of the terrorist events over some period of time have been a guest mass transit. Is the department devoting the resources, the attention, and the time it should be to that particular problem, or are those systems quite fundamentally unprotectable? I wouldn't say at all they're unprotectable. Uh, again, we have to take an approach towards our security and towards our protection here in the United States that engages all of our tools. Uh, first of all, the department has a very dynamic uh, dialogue and relationship, uh, not only with the major cities where uh, these mass transit systems concentrate, uh, but obviously it, they extend nationwide, but also with the private sector, in whose hands many of these mass transit systems lie. Um, and we are committed to a program that engages the public, informs the public to be aware and be alert for potential dangers, uh, and, 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 and employ best practices for their individual travel that reduces uh, their potential vulnerability. We're in dialogue with the private sector, with the municipalities, with the cities, on ways to, to strengthen the protection of mass transit systems. Can we do more? Of course we can do more. If money is allocated based on risk, the risk to mass transit would appear to be very high, and yet it gets a very small piece of the pie. Explain. Well, I mean, you've almost explained it yourself with, the, with your statement. It, 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 in fact, is true. Is, is there enough money to go around for everything that, that it needs to go around to? The answer is no. Uh, does that mean that we're without any means uh, to protect ourselves, to protect our mass transit systems, to protect the traveling public? Again, this is something that we look at not only from the perspective of counterterrorism, but in terms of building national resilience to withstand all risks and hazards and understanding how we, as a, as a federal department, together with other federal agencies, can add value to what the private sector is doing, to what citizens are doing on their own behalf, and what community cities are doing as well. We're doing a quick tour of the waterfront here because a lot of these issues will be dealt with more in depth in later sessions, but I can't let you slip away without asking about cyber, of course. <clears throat> the Department of Homeland Security Inspector General recently did a report which said, you don't have the manpower, you don't have the capabilities, you're just, at this point, not up to the job. There were some good things in that report. <laughs> there were a lot of bad things. Uh, that, that, what, what are we facing with cyber? In, in the first instance, it was the department that called out ensuring our cyber security as a core mission of what it means to talk about a safe and secure and resilient place where the American way of life can thrive, and elevated that. I can't tell you how many 
uh, people have, have come up to myself, to the secretary, to others in the department who work at the state and local level and said, you know what, we, we've always known cyber's been out there, but we never, never kind of have given it the, the kind of attention. We will now. Um, so consciousness raising uh, is an essential element. The other thing that we, we need to do is construct a cyber ecosystem. Cybersecurity is fundamentally about two things, protecting your information and protecting your identity. That's what it means. It means that you can engage in cyber activities confident in the inf that your information is safely getting where it needs to go and the information that is arriving to you is coming from who says they are sending it, from whom? Says, from the person that says they're sending it. Um, how do we do that in a way? The federal government doesn't own all the cyber resources in this country, so we certainly can't do it alone. Uh, but not only do we need to engage the American citizens who rightfully feel as though they own their information, uh, they own their identity, and we also need to engage the private sector as well, and we are. This is a committed partnership uh, that the department is, is very strongly a part of. According to the report, uh, about half of the positions in your cyber division are unfilled. Why is that? Um, it, because I, there's a great competition for highly skilled cyber, uh, cyber capabilities. And we, we aim to become, as the, the Department of Homeland Security, charged uh, with the presidential directive with ensuring the security of the .gov space and working with industry to ensure the security of the .com space to become a home for the world's best cyber professionals. That will take us some time, but we're committed to that. How do you get there? Uh, you get there by, I mean, so How do you track them when you do have that yeah. tremendous competition from private industry and yeah. elsewhere in government? Yeah, 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 track them the same way all of us are attracted to public service. We're attracted be to work on something that's bigger than ourselves and a, and a mutual commitment to this country. Um, do, can we pay them the money that private industry can pay them? Of course we can't. But we can reward them with good work, with opportunities to explore and develop and create a safe and secure cyber environment uh, that will benefit us all. But they read this report and others that have been written and they say, uh, DHS may not have the juice to deal with this problem. Uh, if, 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 uh, you know, if any of us, you know, and we do sometimes, you know, we base our life's decisions on a single uh, report that we read or a single thing a single that we report. hear. No, but, but what's, what's the, the point is for cybersecurity is that for the government to become engaged in a sensibilized way where we can really um, fulfill what our value proposition, um, and, and I feel certain that cybersecurity will not mean that the federal government has now taken charge of ensuring the security of everyone's computer or everyone's iPad or whatever mobile device that they have, that we will have to have a distributed system in which people understand their security needs. We have to create a new ecosystem entirely in cyberspace. And the department will be at the center of that activity together with private sector partners. And the attraction of that, we're convinced, as well as you know, the, the, the commitment to the working environment and the other things, will bring in the best and the brightest. The secretary said recently that um, she thought that the government might need more tools to monitor the internet to keep track of radicalization. What's she talking about? What tools do you need? What, we look at, uh, that we, we know uh, that the internet has had an extraordinary effect. Uh, there may not be any such thing as a minority anymore because you can find your affiliation on the internet um, and you can uh, bypass uh, the barriers to being a party of one or to being feeling alone or isolated. Um, and we need to understand what are the means by which uh, people who feel disaffected are motivated to violence? And is that connection to violence uh, that we are determined to get at? And we know that the internet uh, it serves in some cases as an accelerant uh, for that. Now we saw this in, 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 uh, with, with hate radio uh, in Rwanda in the 1990s. Um, that's not to say that that is the you don't blame that, you don't blame the internet, you don't blame radio, but what you understand is that it's an accelerant uh, to violence and we need to learn more about that uh, to be able to prevent violent things from happening. But what tools is she talking about when she's saying we need to monitor it? We need to understand, we, are we tools, are, about tools are not just uh, technology tools. 
uh, tools are also uh, an understanding and processes and, and work processes and, and procedures, again, guided by our, our norms and our values and our sensibilities. Um, you know, what, what tools do we give our children when we're raising them to be responsible citizens? They don't haul around bags of kit and hardware. We give them tools up here. Um, we, give them, we give them sort of macros, I suppose, you know, to deal with everyday life. Um, we need more tools to, to understand how the internet functions as an accelerant to violence. Um, the color-coded threat system uh, came to be quite the joke. Uh, and there was a, um, a group form that was supposed to take a look specifically and make recommendations about that system. And they came back to the secretary and they said, simplify it, make it easier. It still can have an important function, but it needs some work. Has anything happened to those recommendations? Yeah, so we, we've been, uh, first of all I should say is that um, we have been implementing measures uh, both as a department, as part of the federal family, together with state and locals um, in responding to increased uh, uh, circumstances of concern, increased uh, postures of threat, um, and it had, you know, the, the color coding system has not been uh, the, the mechanism uh, that has conditioned how we respond. I mean, we're putting in place and have put in place and activated a number of measures to respond to, to dynamic threats as, as they have arisen. Um, the Secretary is still uh, looking very closely at those considerations, uh, the, uh, at those recommendations, mindful of, again, how do we put in place a system that is value added to our ability to ensure our protection uh, against terrorism and mm -hmm. against other threats and hazards. When are we gonna see some changes? Uh, when, you know, as the movie said, when, when they're done. I mean, <laughs> um, this is, again, not, no one's been standing still for the past 18 months. There's been a generation of, of learning and conversation in Homeland Security uh, over the past year and a half. Again, building on all the work that has been done previously. We know now what it means when we talk about a secure homeland. We know the, the five mission areas that we need. And we know, frankly, that the American public has a right to expect that we can do three things. They have a right to expect that we can execute those missions. They have a right to expect that we can run ourselves as a department. And they have a right to expect that we can account for the resources that have been entrusted to us. This is an operating department. There are 210,000 men and women in the Department of Homeland Security. 207,000 of them are in the operating components. This is, a this is a department where every single day people wake up at the border and they go to airports or they're on secret service details or they're in the Coast Guard or they're doing search and rescue or they're doing oil spill response. Every single day operating on behalf of the safety and security of the American public. Um, they're, they're our most uh, precious resource, and, and every day we're doing things to create systems and processes to support their work. And yet surveys consistently show they're amongst the most unhappy people in the federal government. Uh, so, and, and they are the most committed and passionate about the mission. You know, there are a number of them who have said to me, um, uh, this, is, this, is, this is something I feel very strongly about. There are a number of them who have said, I went into the Army. In fact, tomorrow will be, I will have been out of the Army as long as I was in, in my adult life. And I've thought a lot about that. I went into the Army, I went to basic training in 1976. It was not a great time to be in the Army. And it was extraordinary, the, the post-Vietnam feeling, the Vietnam era feeling. I have had people in our department tell me that that's how they feel um, by the American public. Um, and we have to change that. These women, men and women are every bit as committed as the men are men and women in uniform. I'm married to a soldier, I was a soldier. They're extraordinary, the contribution that they're making. So too, the men and women in Homeland Security. And it is it's my privilege to be their leader, but it is my greater privilege to be one of their number. Um, and what we have to do is to give them the conditions, the tools, the leadership uh, and the working environment that they deserve to match the passion they bring to the job. But you know where a lot of Americans interface with your department is at the airport. And a lot of people say they feel like they're perps when they walk into a screening line at the airport. Um, they, they shouldn't feel that way. 
a, a lot of the a TSA agents every single day, most of them, the vast majority of them are committed professionals um, who, are, who are, have one job and one job alone to ensure your safe air travel. And they do it with professionalism and commitment. One last question on the personnel issue, suitability. Um, people who have secret clearances who want to come to work for your department are put through an additional screening for suitability. Why do they have to go through that? Doesn't the secret clearance do that for you? And doesn't it slow the filling of positions and perhaps keep some people away from government service? It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, First of all, we're streamlining the processes. Um, there's a lot less suitability checks being done that were done previously. Um, it's, re it's, a requirement, it's a requirement of federal service. Elsewhere, uh, people have uh, departments, for example, the Department of Defense takes your security clearance as evidence of your suitability. Um, and we are moving in that direction. But we also have a number of law enforcement. We're the largest federal law enforcement um, uh, agency uh, in the federal government. Um, having a security clearance doesn't entitle you to work uh, in a law enforcement job. Um, but we are working to streamline the process because it certainly does slow it down. And anybody who's been in the federal hiring system knows it doesn't need any help in slowing down. So we're working on that. A quick question on borders, since that's one of the priorities that you brought up. Um, a lot of concern, obviously, about how porous the southern border in particular is. Do you have indications that that is being exploited uh, by terrorists, that there are people coming across the southern border or, in fact, the northern border? Uh, the southern border, no, we, not, we don't. As Secretary Napolitano, uh, someone who is, was a, border, a governor of a border state uh, and who has ridden every mile of the southern border, has said many, many times, the southern border has never been uh, more secure than it is today. Um, but it's still and, not anything close to 100% secure. Uh, and the northern border certainly isn't. Uh, and, and again, what our borders uh, are as secure as they have ever been. Um, and we have to create a system that does keep dangerous uh, people and goods out, but also a system that expedites legitimate trade and travel. And so we have to find ways, and we are finding ways, again, working also with industry, to expedite that legitimate trade and travel so we can focus on those who might be dangerous. So how do you make it secure? SBI net didn't deliver as promised. Personnel, you've surged a lot more people to the border, but it hasn't, you know, it's you a, have it's a human a, chain across the border well, making it secure. That's, that's right, I mean, uh, and, know, and, and, and even then. Fences can be climbed. Right, and even then, someone goes off shift, you know? I mean, it's, right. it's, there's no question so how of do you daisy do chaining our way uh, to security. But what it is, it's a question of working uh, from the federal government's point of view, this is our responsibility, we know that. Working with personnel, working with technology, working with procedures to strengthen uh, uh, those areas of the border where we know it needs strengthening. Working with state and local officials to develop very good situational awareness and ability to interdict when we know uh, trouble is coming. But also, equally, an ability to expedite legitimate trade and travel uh, to be able to get it on its way, particularly in these tough financial times. I want to open it up to you guys. So we have a couple of microphones here. Um, we'd love to get some questions here. And please, if you'd identify yourself and your organization. I see a hand up right or I see two hands up. Let's start with the one further back here. We'll get a mic to you. Hi. My name is Quentin Durwood, and I'm uh, just a citizen. Um, there was a report I saw on the internet two weeks ago from a local Arizona TV station, uh, WSBTV.com, and basically it reported that there were hundreds of people from nations that sponsor terrorism, including Afghanistan, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, Sudan, and Yemen, who have been detained as they are legally crossed into the uh, southern part of the country. And uh, just as an ongoing um, follow-on question from what you were comment, commenting on, I mean, is that, is that a, do you think a likely number that there are hundreds of potential uh, people from terrorist nations who are crossing on a regular basis across that border? I, I haven't seen that report, so I'm afraid I can't comment on it. Um, what I can tell you is that we're, we are working every day to ensure the safety and the security, I should say, of the southern border. Uh, and as Secretary Napolitano, who said, one who knows this area well, one who knows Arizona well, one who knows the border uh, extremely well, um, this border has never been more secure. Uh, and we're working to strengthen the measures that we have in place. No single part 
of the system, whether it's fence, as the Secretary has said, fence is not a strategy, but a combination of personnel, technology, processes, procedures, um, will, uh, we will continue to work on those areas to strengthen the border. Uh, there was someone else here with a hand up in the blue shirt. Search. Sean Waterman from the Washington Times. Um, in the current uh, fiscal climate, isn't it finally time to get rid of the kind of pork barrel funding formula for DHS grants and replace a formula that's based on the fact that North Dakota has the same number of senators as New York does with one that recognizes the different risks that are faced there? So in, in our view, um it, it's very clear, uh, everyone faces some risk. Uh, and we know that as we have transited into a very austere fiscal environment compared to previous years, certainly that a number of things need to be re-examined. We need to streamline our grants program to make it more accessible and usable by the states as well. Um, and that's something that we're doing. But what about this problem of distribution and politics? Uh, Homeland Security, again, it's an extraordinary uh, department. Um, there are 108 congressional committees and subcommittees that oversee the work of the department. Um, there are 50 states, untold communities, um, that are important constituencies for the Department of Homeland Security. And so these decisions are always taken uh, mindful of all the needs we need to serve. I want to ask you about that congressional piece. There are a multitude of committees who claim jurisdiction over some part of the department. I sometimes look at the schedule and see one individual talking several times in front of different committees. How destructive is that um, for the department? How distracting? How much time does that consume? And, and well, what the, difference would it make uh, if Congress streamlined oversight of your department? Um, it, it, we think it would be an important strengthening uh, component, um, and you know we're very grateful. Frankly, Congress has been very generous to the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we acknowledge that, and, and um, we we are very grateful for it. We also know that we have to answer, we have to account. But this is Homeland Security. Twenty committees. Uh, one hundred and eight. Is it one hundred and eight? It's one hundred and eight, and subcommittees. Yeah, it's a lot. It's ridiculous, isn't it? It's a lot. <laughs> Back there, go ahead. Hi, Mike is a couple with Newsweek. I, I have to say, Deputy Secretary, I'm a bit baffled by your remark about the, uh, uh, the Secretary claiming that the border, southern border has never been as secure uh, as it is today. Uh, what are you basing that in? What, what is your metric? And given What's happened recently uh, is the state legislature in Arizona and its governor, the state Secretary Napolitano used to be the governor of, under some mass delusion. Uh, how are you, what is your basis for that claim? Uh, I think the secretary has been very clear. Uh, and um, again, uh, the number of resources that have been committed to the border, uh, the level and, and sophistication of processes that we are applying at the border, uh, the training, the qualifications of border agents combined with the other elements, uh, fence, there's more fence than has ever uh, been before, there's a greater use of technology and process. Um, but there are still people coming across. Arizona, or the state legislature don't seem to think that is the case at all. I certainly would not presume to answer for the state legislature of Arizona. Do you have any idea why they would have passed that law if the border is as secure as you're claiming it is? I, I, I am prepared to speak about the Department of Homeland Security. There are still plenty of people coming across, however. Still a distance to go, significant distance on border security, wouldn't you say? Okay. And isn't that, you, you cited that as one of the fundamental things that the department had to right, grapple right. with. Absolutely, and what, what we have to do uh, in securing our borders is keep dangerous goods and people out. And there is no single uh, silver bullet for that purpose, as we discussed. There is no daisy chain through a combination of personnel, technology, processes, procedures, partnerships, in the federal government, yes, uh, playing its role and responsibility. Um, it, it, it is a constant challenge. I mean, you're never done securing your border. Uh, let me see, let me go over here, I see a hand up.
One of the major recommendations of the 9-11 Commission was to deal with the interoperability issue of all the communication systems the various first responders had, police, uh, fire, they can't talk to each other. Nine years in, there's been some progress, but not very much progress. And so uh, I'm curious your thoughts. By the way, I didn't introduce myself. My name's David Bishop. I work for Alcatel-Lucent. So I'm an old signal officer. Um, interoperability is about whether or not the radios can talk to each other and whether or not those people operating on the radios recognize each other's procedures um, and that they have an interactive uh, uh, way of managing what they have to do in the event of a crisis. I've done a lot of crisis response. This is a key uh, element that, that really inhibits uh, the best kind of crisis response and the coordination of assets. Just as you described, uh, we've made some progress. We haven't nearly made enough progress. Uh, municipalities, um, again, have very strong preferences in this regard. We're committed to the interoperability agenda, um, and, and we will continue to work on that because it is so fundamental to effective crisis response. And, and what we know about crisis response is the Department of Homeland Security is not the first responder. You know, uh, you know people, crises happen somewhere. They involve somebody. And very often, the first responders are not even local authorities. They're locals. Uh, so we know that this is where the work is done. We know where this, that this is the front line. Um, and we need to do our part to strengthen it, in part through better interoperability. Yellow shirt out there? That's you. Good morning. I'm yellow shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Maurice Sundberg. Um, apropos some of your statements regarding the oversight, 108 committees, 210,000 people, do you think it'd be wise to consider breaking up this department? You've got an enormous bureaucracy here, meaning that which has to do with absolute national security and the other part, FEMA, hurricanes, floods, and all of that, it might serve you much better if we were in two different agencies. No. So uh, you're talking to somebody who, who spent their first half of their adult life in the Army, and then I went to the UN, and now I'm in Homeland Security. I've got a bit of a specialty in large, far-flung, hardworking and challenged bureaucracies, of which this is one. Um, this department uh, is an extraordinary combination of these assets. FEMA is better off for its co-location in the department with the Coast Guard. Uh, the Secret Service is better off in this department with its co-location of other assets. Uh, we are not. That, that issue is resolved. Uh, right, about, right down here in front. But I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> Shay Bushinsky, I'm from uh, AGT International. I wanted to ask you, you spoke a lot about stopping terror incidents while they take place, which is, as we know, very difficult. How about, um, have you considered launching programs to stop incitement out of the country and educating the extreme Muslim world against committing these acts? And uh, linked to that, um, Khalid Sheikh Muhammad's trial, is it gonna take place in New York? And what's your take about exposing this trial to the white public, Al-Qaeda's methods and uh, school of thought? So on the last question, I'll, I'm not going to address that. I'll leave that for the Department of Justice uh, to handle. Um, the, the federal government does engage internationally um, with the Muslim world. I mean, the president's speech in Cairo um, was a, a resounding statement of the president's view uh, of, of things. Um, and we have all been working uh, consistent within that view. We have a particular challenge here as well. We know that. Uh, the, the Muslim communities that exist in this country uh, bring a richness uh, to our society, bring a commitment uh, to the American way of life that we share. We also know that, that there, are, they are, there are larger communities within these communities, uh, within which these communities exist, and they all have to engage. And so we don't, we don't believe that, again, this is a problem that you can simply uh, arrest your way out of. Um, it has to be one built on engagement of the structural uh, putting in place the structural elements of a capable society 
you know, representative governance, market economic activity, robust civil society based on the rule of law, all of the things we know and we're committed to in this country. Um, and we need to remind ourselves that it's available to all American citizens um, and enlist their help. Um, and, and that is our concern and, and we're a part of that. Over here. Uh, good morning, ma'am. Um, Joe Valencia's Committee on Homeland Security. Jean uh, Meserve asked earlier about other tools that you might need to uh, fight the war on terror. And if you look at the international threat that we deal with, um, you know, we have NSA, we have CIA, we have more capabilities um, externally to the United States monitoring what's going on than we could possibly hope to have uh, internally. Uh, internally, it seems like a lot of our ability to detect a terrorist uh, threat in the making either comes from a tip from an informant um, because the terrorist decided to reach out to someone um, or in the example of uh, the Fort Dick Six because they screw up and decide they want to have a VHS turned into a DVD. Is that, uh, is that a sufficient strategy or what other tools are, should we look at? I mean, we just went through a bloody battle looking at FISA and that still dealt with an international nexus, not a, st a strict internal nexus. So this is what we're thinking about right now. Um, the tools that work abroad may not be the tools that you know, perfectly translate into a domestic environment. We have, though, several of them. I, I ticked them off earlier. We have the tools of, at the border. Uh, we have law enforcement, both federal uh, and state and local. Importantly, state and local. They have enormous information and knowledge of their communities. Um, they recognize aberrant behavior. They understand when things are very, very badly wrong. Um, we need to engage them and, and, and connect them better through fusion centers, through other um, processes for information sharing so that people have the information they need and again, understand the action implications of the information that they have. And we have the American public. Um, and it's an important tool and resource. Again, that it, it helps us in Homeland Security every time uh, when we're confronting uh, how to develop strategies like this to remind us of, of the American public, the power of the American public, the power of American values and norms um, in approaching the challenges that we face. And I'm very optimistic of our, about our ability to succeed. No new tools, no new authorities would be needed by the department to prosecute an internal threat. Oh, did you want proposed legislation? <laughs> Ideally, yes. But so, yeah. Brian. <laughs> See um, I had a follow-up, actually. This triggered something in my mind about the Shazad case. Times Square, target number one, two, or three on the list, I'm sure. A lot of time, effort been put into securing Times Square. A guy comes in there, he parks a truck, and leaves, and to our knowledge, not one surveillance camera caught him in Times Square. Is something not working? Isn't that why we've invested in that sort of technology? Again, no single piece, no single link in the chain is going to make you secure. Yeah, but you uh, relied on a, on a vendor here. New, New York City takes a bat seat to no one. I think I'm, I'm a New Yorker. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to chat with Commissioner Kelly um, in its commitment to counterterrorism and its commitment to security. But, and, but I would just say from our own perspective um, that I, I've spoken about the American public. You know, we are our best asset. We have to, we, we, we are the, the the guardians of our civil rights, our civil liberties, our privacy. But we're also the guardians of our safety and security at the beginning of the day. But is it appropriate in a place like Times Square that it should come down to a vendor noticing something out of line? It did work. It did work in this instance. But it, it did work in this particular instance. But is that what we should be relying on? Is it, is it, it, in a place like Times Square. Sorry, the, you're not mic people can't pick up. But so it, 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 I, I can't imagine I mean, that it would be inappropriate. Uh, imagine if this individual had raised this alarm and it was ignored because sorry, you're not the camera. And that would be interesting. You're not the camera. Worse. So um, no, we need all of our tools. We need to mobilize all of our resources and assets together. Um, this is a joint enterprise. Um, question? Uh, I see a woman out here, I think, with a pink around the neck. Sorry to do the color identification, but. Oh, Catherine's 
Yes, uh, Catherine, Catherine Harridge, Fox News. I have a couple of questions related to uh, homegrown uh, extremism, if I may. Uh, first of all, how would you characterize the threat of the American cleric in Yemen, Anwar al-Awlaki, to the U.S. homeland? And do you believe it's in the U.S.'s uh, long-term interest to either see him killed, captured for intelligence, or kept uh, on the run as he is today? I think he's made no uh, uh, secret of his animosity and determination to foment violence against this country. Uh, I think he is a danger uh, that, that ought to be addressed aggressively. What about the kill, capture, or on the run? Um, okay. <laughs> what do you think is in our long-term interest? Is it to kill an American citizen overseas? Is it to capture him to try and glean intelligence? Or is it to try and force him underground as he's living, from what I understand, constantly moving from place to place on a daily basis? No, when we talk about the long-term interest of this country, um, in Homeland Security, we, you know, we use the, the phrase, a safe, secure, resilient place where the American way of life can thrive. What does this country need at this moment um, in its history? We need a safe and secure homeland. We need a dynamic economic engine that can generate new wealth. We need strong friends and allies. Uh, we need predictable relations with others. That's the rule of law. Um, we need fundamentally um, to keep ourselves secure and address threats when they exist. Is he a threat? He's a threat. Do we need to address it? Yes. I was just wondering the best way to address it. But in any event, uh, my follow-up question is on this issue of what I'll call digital jihadists or virtual jihadists who are um, sort of inspired to act through people like uh, Alaki. Um, People like Alaki have a message which is really selling to these people. So what do you see as our message to win this war of ideas? It's, um, it, 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 it speaks to the heart, I think, of uh, the, the, not just the disaffection. Um, uh, I spent a lot of years um, thinking about violent conflict and how do you prevent violent conflict. And when we started doing that, people laughed at us. You know, how do you, the conflict's always been around. War's always been around. You can't prevent war. And my reaction was, you know, war is not the weather. We shouldn't act like it is. And so what you're speaking to are the root causes, uh, not only of the, of the disaffection and the anger. Um, and, and that will be for those who specialize in that to address. What we're concerned is about when that disaffection turns violent um, and the means by which it turns violent, and the potential threat that that violence poses to the American way of life and to our homeland. Um, and we're determined to do everything we can every single day to prevent that violence from happening. And we have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Deputy Secretary Lute, thank you so much. Thank you very much to the Deputy